Hello everyone and welcome to the second in our material history seminar series for 2023. Today we'll be discussing Australian food icons and it promises to be just wonderful. I'm Margaret Anderson from the Old Treasury Building and I'm delighted that you've been able to join us today. Let me begin by acknowledging that I'm speaking to you from the unceded land of the Wurundjeri Woiwurrung people of the Kulin Nation. We thank them for their care of culture and of country and pay our respects to elders past, present and emerging. But I'd also uh, like to acknowledge any First Nations people who may be joining us from elsewhere. Material Histories is a seminar series offered jointly by the Old Treasury Building and the Australian Catholic University. In each discussion, we explore an aspect of material history through an object or a series of objects. The seminars are open to anyone with an interest in material history, and we hope to cast the net, the subject net widely in terms of both time and place. So if you're interested in contributing, please do get in touch. We'll pop some email addresses on the screen at the end of the seminar. Now, just a few words about the structure of the seminar before I hand over to our chair today. I'm sure you're all well used to digital seminars by now, but just to confirm that this is a webinar format, so you will see and hear the speakers only and it is being recorded. If you have any te technical difficulties, please use the chat button at the bottom of your screens and Katie behind the scenes will do her very best to help you. If you have a question, and we do hope you will, please use the Q&A button. And of course, please keep your questions and comments courteous. It's now my great pleasure to introduce the co-convener of Material Histories, Lorinda Kramer, who will chair the discussion today. Dr. Lorinda Kramer is a research fellow in the Gender and Women's History Research Center in the Institute for Humanities and Social Sciences at ACU. She has a specialist interest in gender, dress and textiles, but a general interest in material histories of all kinds. Over to you, Lorinda. Thanks so much, Margie. I'd like to join you in welcoming everyone today to our Material Histories Seminar, Australian Food Icons. I'm really thrilled to be chairing this seminar, not only because our icons today, Veggie Knight and the Australian Women's Weekly Birthday Cake Book, are both very close to my heart, but because I know you'll greatly enjoy hearing about the insights that our two speakers will bring to them. We're so excited to have Dr. Hannah Viney and Dr. Lauren Samuelson with us to share their fascinating material histories. And I know we're in for a real treat. So it's my pleasure to first introduce Dr. Hannah Viney. Hannah's research explores 20th century Australia's cultural, social and political history with her PhD at Monash University investigating women's anti-nuclear activism between 1945 and 1965. But today, Hannah is presenting on Vegemite, that delicious spread that was central to my childhood, as I'm sure it was for many of you, and still has a really welcome place in my pantry today. So Hannah's presentation is titled, Happy Little Vegemite Soldiers Rationing Vegemite and National Identity in World War II. Over to you, Hannah. <laughs> Welcome and thank you for having me. Um, I want to apologise first because you will get the Vegemite jingle stuck in your heads today um, and I will take no uh, control over that. So, you know, just live with that fact. So what I want to start with, well, you know, in the words of Australia's own overlooked poet laureate, Men at Work, and their seminal work, Land Down Under, the central protagonist is on a journey of self-reflection and discovery across the world. So in Brussels, the protagonist meets an imposing figure who is six foot four and full of muscles. Like the protagonist, the audience may feel a sense of dread at the appearance of such a figure. But men at work are quick to reassure. He is friendly. Indeed, the man in Brussels could be read as an omniscient god guiding the song's protagonist on his journey to enlightenment. For though the protagonist travels around the world, he is at heart an Australian, as the man in Brussels knows just by looking at him. 
To remind the protagonist of his identity, the man of Brussels offers him a Vegemite sandwich with a smile. The man of Brussels then reveals through the sharing of a cultural foodstuff that he too is Australian. This moment of shared national solidarity through the metaphor of a Vegemite sandwich pushes our protagonist onward in his journey, reassured of his place in the world. So perhaps that's a load of twaddle that I can use to pretend that my literature degree was relevant. Um, but also Vegemite is indeed a cultural icon and it's so embedded in so many Australian sense of a shared national identity. So there's roughly 22 million jars of Vegemite manufactured in the Port Melbourne factory every year and around 80% of Australian households have a jar in the cupboard. In 2022, the City of Melbourne Council declared the distinctive smell of the Vegemite factory holds significant heritage value. But Vegemite's place as an Australian staple and icon wasn't always so assured. For the story of Vegemite's rise in popularity, we need to look at the two world wars. So Vegemite came into existence thanks to German U-boats. In the early 20th century, the British spread Marmite was a popular import in Australia, but World War I interrupted the Marmite supply. In response to British blockades, German U-boats attacked Allied trade routes, sinking ships full of British supplies, including Marmite. Due to its patent, Marmite could not be manufactured in Australia. And so with incoming shipments of the spread sunk by the Germans, there was a gap in the market. Fred Walker saw this gap and decided to try and create an Australian version of Marmite that could be locally produced. In 1923, he hired Melbourne food technologist Cyril P. Callister to experiment with brewer's yeast from the Carlton Brewery. Callister's experiments produced a thicker, stronger spread than Marmite, with added vegetable extracts that combined to contribute to a unique flavour. As the 1920s progressed, the possible health benefits of vitamins was a hot topic, and so Callister tested the vitamin content of Vegemite, finding the spread had high concentrations of B vitamins. The health benefits of B vitamins would be essential in establishing Vegemite's dominance. But Australians were wary of Vegemite when it first appeared on grocery store shelves. This may have been brand loyalty to Marmite, or it may have been due to belief that British made was better than Australian made. So Walker tried to rebrand in 1928, renaming Vegemite Pa Will as a play on words. If Marmite, Pa Will. The rebrand was short-lived, though Marmite, Pa didn't. Australian buyers were not interested in Powell any more than they had been in Vegemite, so the name was reverted. So this began to change in the 1930s, when Walker hired American advertiser J. Walter Thompson to take over the Vegemite account. Thompson quickly launched an advertising campaign that offered free samples and competitions to draw in buyers. Kraft secured an endorsement from both the British and Australian Medical Associations for Vegemite. The Australian Medical Journal allowed advertisements for Vegemite in its pages and doctors were encouraged to send in for a free Vegemite sample. In 1935 and 1936, purchases of Kraft Walker products, including the popular Kraft cheese, came with a coupon for a free jar of Vegemite. In the Depression years when money was tight, this would have been particularly appealing. A big ticket campaign saw the winners of a Limerick competition win a brand new Pontiac car. Sadly for us, the winning entry has been lost, but if you have any suggestions, please send them to me. I would be very curious. I'm not very good at creating limericks. So while these strategies increased Vegemite's recognition and brand value, it would actually take another world war before the brand began to be linked to national identity. So Marmite was again in short supply in Australia, as Britain kept their Marmite supplies for the home front and the war front. In Australia, Vegemite too was in short supply. When other foodstuffs were hard to come by, Vegemite was marketed as an ideal and nutritious replacement for young children and ill Australians. One advertisement read, quote, if you're one of those who don't need Vegemite medicinally, the thousands of invalids and babies are asking you to deny yourself of it for the time being. With the high quantities of B vitamins and the long shelf life, the Department of Supply also saw Vegemite as an invaluable resource for the Australian Armed Forces. The army began buying out Vegemite in bulk and including it in ration kits sent to soldiers on the front lines. Due to the demand from the armed services, Kraft Walker Foods was forced to ration the Vegemite available to civilians. So rationing was introduced in Australia in May 1942 to manage shortages of essential goods, particularly goods that were needed for armed forces. 
At the end of 1942, the Australian government passed the Black Marketing Act to try and curb breaches of rationing regulations. The Australian newspapers reported several instances of individuals arrested and charged for stockpiling food and supplies, including, in many cases, jars of Vegemite. In contrast to the difficulty of supply, Kraft actually increased their advertisements for Vegemite. So wartime advertisements leaned into this lack of supply, telling consumers that they couldn't get Vegemite because it was so in demand for the troops due to its incredible health benefits. So one ad in the Argus read, Vegemite fights for the men up north in all imperial areas where our men and those of our allies are engaged. And in military hospitals, Vegemite is in great demand because of its value in fighting vitamin B deficiency diseases. That's why the fighting forces have first call on all Vegemite produced. And that is why Vegemite is in short supply for civilian consumption. But it won't always be that way. When the peace is won and our men come home, ample stocks of this extra tasty yeast extract will be available for everyone. So even though most people on the home front couldn't buy Vegemite during the war, this candy advertising campaign firmly cemented Vegemite with Australian nationalism. For those on the home front, supporting Australian production was a crucial part of supporting the war. For housewives, the simple act of grocery shopping was positioned as contributing to the war effort. So whether Australians had been interested in eating Vegemite before the war or not, and whether they would have attempted to buy it when supplies were being sent to the front, these ads tapped into the widespread support for Australian involvement in the war, and in particular support for the Australians fighting overseas. So by the time the war ended, Vegemite was firmly cemented in the nation's mind as fundamentally Australian. So over the next decades, more clever advertising would consolidate this image, forever linking Vegemite with Australian national identity. So in the post-war era, Vegemite again leaned into the health benefits of the spread. As the post-war baby boom became apparent, Kraft successfully marketed Vegemite as a nutritionally rich food vital for child development. Post-war, the continuing impact of rationing and food shortages led to concerns about the nation's health. With concerns about the rebuilding of a healthy white population, good nutrition for children was seen as particularly important. Many food brands recognised the value of appealing to these concerns. So Vegemite advertisements emphasised healthy children and adopted a pseudoscientific approach highlighting the health benefits of B vitamins. So this cinema advertisement from 1948 illustrates how Vegemite was presented as a health food for children and the scientific veneer that the campaign adopted. <laughs> All over Australia, our baby health centres, clinics and day nurseries are doing wonderful work for young mothers and young Australians. Here is a typical scene at a baby health centre. Here are the mothers with their children, all seeking and about to get friendly and expert advice. Perhaps young Johnny here cries too much at night, keeps dad, mum and the neighbours awake. Whatever can mum do about it? Or Susie has hives. Is it because of something she ate? What's the best thing to put on those spots? Young Albert, all of a sudden, he doesn't like his milk anymore. He spills it, pushes it away, and just picks at his food too. This is Albert's first visit here and his mother is worried. He has never done anything like that before. Let's listen in on this conversation. We may get some good advice. Yes, that sometimes happens with children. Now, I suggest you mix a little Vegemite in with his milk and give him Vegemite spread on bread and butter. Most children adore Vegemite, and it's good for them from the age of five months or even younger. That sister was right. Albert's got his appetite back with a vengeance. And see how he laps up his milk now. Vegemite is recommended so highly for children because it is rich in vitamin B1, which stimulates the appetite, vitamin B2, which is essential for sturdy growth, and niacin, the anti-pelagric factor for clear, healthy skin. Yes, Vegemite is a great food and so tasty. Not only for the kiddies, but for all your family. And remember, Vegemite is not only tastier, but it costs less. So always ask for Vegemite, made by Kraft. <laughs> I feel quite sorry for Albert having to drink Vegemite and milk. That really doesn't sound appealing. So it was also in the early 1950s that the ear-catching Vegemite jingle was first composed and used in advertisements on the radio. 
jauntily telling parents that children who ate Vegemite would grow stronger every single week. So to help mothers make the most of the nutritional benefits of Vegemite, Kraft published a Vegemite cookbook in 1959. The prelude to the cookbook told readers that it is in the hands of every individual housewife that the health of the nation lies. After a long explanation of the science of nutrition, including calories and vitamins, the cookbook broke down all the ways Vegemite could help increase the consumer's health, seemingly in every area of possible nutritional deficit, including not only B vitamins, but also calcium, phosphates, iron, protein, and amino acids. To make the most of this life-giving elixir, the cookbook included recipes such as Vegemite with stuffed tomatoes, which were tomatoes filled with rice, craft cheese, and Vegemite then baked, jellied luncheon sausage, which was a hard-boiled egg, sausage, Vegemite gelatin, and nutmeg, or a Vegemite lifesaver, a beaten egg, tomato sauce, lemon juice, Vegemite, and water mixed into a drink and served over ice, which I think is actually a way to be the opposite of a lifesaver and might actually kill you. So this emphasis on, veg emphasis on Vegemite as part of a healthy diet for families and growing children continued over the rest of the 20th century and into the 21st. So over these decades, Vegemite branded merchandise appeared on the shelves, including these Bakelite beakers from the 1950s and 1960s. Bright colours were used to appeal to children and stand out on the shelves. The link between Vegemite and Aussie identity spread internationally in the 1980s with Men at Work's Land Down Under. The 1980s, which this is a still from, and I just love the visual image of it. So the 1980s also saw the return of the Happy Little Vegemites jingle. So Kraft revived the original 1956 ad and recolorized it to appeal to nostalgic young parents who had grown up with the original TV campaign. We're happy little veggie mites, as bright as bright can be. We all enjoy our veggie mites for breakfast, lunch and tea. Our mummies say we're growing stronger every single week because we love our veggie mites. We all adore our veggie mites. It was a right in every cheek. Everyone has their way of eating veggie mites, even straight from the jar. But there's one thing we all agree on. We love our veggie mites. The jingle was used again in 2010 with the general manager of Vegemite at the time stating, quote, the jingle has over time become just as much of an icon as Vegemite itself. In fact, we have been told that more Australians know the words to the happy little Vegemites jingle than the national anthem. And I believe him, that wouldn't surprise me at all. So since the rise of internet videos, including on YouTube and TikTok, there have been innumerable videos of non-Australians trying Vegemite for the first time and just as many videos of Australians crying in horror at the excessive amount of Vegemite eaten straight from the jar, or tube in this case. You can buy officially licensed Vegemite merchandise online, and there is an assortment of Vegemite food collaborations, some of which are appealing and some of which sound as appetising as drinking a Vegemite lifesaver. In February 2022, when international arrivals to Australia was reopened, arriving travellers were welcomed to Sydney Airport with a DJ playing men at work, a koala soft toy and jars of Vegemite. And announced only a week or so ago, Kraft has put forward an open casting call for children to appear in a recreation of the original TV ad to celebrate the centenary of Vegemite. So in the 21st century, ask any Australian and most will say Vegemite must be in the DNA. But this indelible link between a commercial food product made to mimic a British spread and national Australian identity likely wouldn't have been made if it weren't for German U-boats and a very clever advertising campaign in World War II. Thank you very much. Anna, thank you so much. That was absolutely brilliant. And I love how you brought us up to the present day. I had no idea people were welcomed back into our into Australia with jars of Vegemite. That is super fascinating. So we're going to come back to some of these ideas, I know, in our Q&A. But first, I would like to introduce you to our second speaker, Dr. Lauren Samuelson. Lauren's an honorary fellow at the University of Wollongong, and her research interests span cultural history, the history of food and drink, the history of popular culture, and gender history, with her PhD thesis considering the influence of the Australian Women's Weekly magazine and cookbooks on the development of Australian food culture from the 1930s through to the 1980s. Lauren is speaking about a book that was that, that, that my sisters and I constantly reached for, 
and which every year we made a really difficult, almost impossible decision of which cake in the birthday cake book to ask our mum to make. So today, Lauren is baking up an Australian icon for children's birthday cake book. Thank you, Lauren. Thank you so much, Lorinda. And thank you all for coming along today day uh, or watching this recording later. It's a real pleasure to be speaking to you about one of my favourite topics, which is cake. Uh, but before I start, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land upon which I live and work, the Dural people, and pay my respects to them and to any Indigenous Australians who are joining us here today. When Ellen Sinclair, Pamela Clark, and the rest of the Australian Women's Weekly Test Kitchen staff decided to publish a book of birthday cake recipes in 1980, little did they know that they were creating what has since been called the greatest book ever published in this country. On the contrary, the making of the book was a bit slapdash. The cakes were made directly onto bench tops. The backs of the cakes were often left undecorated and um, photos were taken after Sinclair gave the instruction to shoot it, little darling. There was no food styling involved. The cakes were, in the words of Pamela Clark, a bit messy, a bit tacky, but also filled with sentimental loveliness. While the test kitchen was pleased with the book, they were shocked to see that it didn't sell strongly to begin with, unlike some of their other titles which sold out remarkably quickly. People weren't buying the book until there was a birthday in the family, so it took a little while to take off. But once it did, there was no stopping it. It's been reprinted at least 25 times since its publication. It has also become an integral part of our popular culture since its publication. In 2009, for example, comedian Josh Earl wrote and starred in a comedy musical show titled Josh Earl versus the Australian Women's Weekly Birthday Cake Book, which ran from 2009 to 2015 and featured bangers such as The Train Cake. Most recently, The Duck Cake and the book from which it springs featured in an episode of Bluey titled Duck Cake. Its integration into our popular imaginary ensures that this book and the cakes that we bake from it will be around for a long time. Now, some of you probably have a copy of the children's birthday cake book kicking around in the back of a cupboard, or maybe it's in relatively high rotation being brought out for family birthdays. You also, like myself, may have childhood memories of choosing one of the cakes, of flipping through the pages of the book, staring at those brightly coloured images and imagining how good that cake would taste on your birthday. If you're a parent, you may have feelings of anxiety associated with the book, looking at some of these constructions, wondering if perhaps you'll have a cake fail, nailed it, and disappoint your child. But beyond these personal memories and anxieties, this book, with more than 100 recipes for cakes, as well as instructions on how to pipe icing, make marshmallow flowers and colour coconut with food dye, provides us a window into Australian culture. So cakes and baking have always been central to Australian food culture. In the late 19th century, Lady Victoria Buxton reported that Australia should be called the land of cakes, as the young ladies are remarkably good cake and scone makers. And really, this stems from the fact that from the mid to late 19th century, the basic ingredients for baking, flour, butter, eggs and sugar, were readily available and relatively cheap. And Australians consumed huge amounts of sugar. At the turn of the 20th century, Australia's per capita consumption of sugar was really unbelievably high, almost 25% more than Britain's at 104 pounds or 48 kilos per person per year. So to put this in perspective, our sugar consumption peaked in 1951 at 57 kilos per capita per year. And today we consume approximately 42 kilos per person per year, which is still very high as calls for a sugar tax reveal. What this makes clear though, is that Australians have long had a sweet tooth. Baking was also, as Lady Buxton points out, the preserve of women. Cakes became associated with femininity and feminine pursuits. 
cakes were an area of cookery where women could experiment and be creative. They weren't necessary to the diet, like the main meal of the day, um, which with its emphasis on meat and vegetables were coded masculine and left very little room for the imagination. If we think back to popular images from the mid 20th century, we see beautifully made up women uh, presiding over their domestic domains, usually furnished with a sunbeam mix master while they are baking for their families. Now, whether or not this image of the housewife was accurate or simply an advertising tool, what is certain is that in the mid 20th century, home baking was important and housewives earned their reputations as good cooks on the back of their baking skills. Now, one thing was common about these mid-century cakes, and that was that they should be baked from scratch. But by the 1970s, packaged cake mix was becoming a suitable substitute for women who were increasingly, in the words of the Women's Weekly, busy. This shift was entwined with changing gender roles. More women were working outside the home, and yet, like today, were still expected to undertake the lion's share of domestic duties, including cooking. One shortcut that the weekly suggested was using cake mix, which is why in the birthday cake book, the test kitchen specified using butter cake packet mix for the cake itself. But why birthday cakes? Well, birthday cakes as we know them are a relatively new phenomena, having not been labeled as such until the late 19th century. And throughout the 20th century, birthday cakes became increasingly significant, the centerpiece of the birthday party. And in and of themselves are significant cultural artifacts. To have a wonderful awe inspiring cake baked just for you on your special day is a symbol of status and prestige and is often a cultural reflection of your identity. For a child, does the cake point out whether they're a boy or a girl? Do they like trains or racing cars, horses or cats? As birthday cakes became important to children, they also became important to parents. By the 1980s, the preparation of a birthday cake for a child carried with it elements of conspicuous consumption and competition, as well as connotations of maternal love and care. While a working woman may have found it difficult to be a successful housewife or homemaker while employed outside the home, she could still demonstrate her success as a mother. One of the ways in which women could demonstrate their mothering prowess was through the creation of novel children's birthday cakes and the use of cake mix leveled the playing field somewhat. Which is not to say that some of the cakes in the birthday cake book were an easy feat. Some of them were notoriously difficult. As Pamela Clark has pointed out, the tip truck cake is a treacherous affair. In an interview I had with her, she said that the cake was almost impossible and that she advised many parents to avoid it. She said that people would phone and say, I'm going to make the tip truck. Oh, I said, because I made that tip truck and I'd try to steer them off it because it is such a monster of a cake to make. I'm going to make the tip truck for little Johnny and have you got any extra tips? And I say, don't make it, but little Johnny gets something else. Yet parents were undeterred and many stayed up all night baking a cake for their child. As Clark pointed out, the child really doesn't care if the cake is perfect or not, if it's a bit ratty and a bit tacky and a bit whatever. Rather, it was the desire to do something that nobody else can really do well for your child that prompted this emotional and literal labour. In these cakes, the focus was on the decorative appeal, the piles of lollies and dollies, not the culinary attributes of the cake. The cake itself was merely a vehicle for the filling and icing, the components which more accurately reflected the child. Beyond the gendered labor involved in baking the cake, um, as ephemeral and delicious historical objects themselves, the cakes often reflected idealized notions of gender in the late 20th century. The book contained, separate chapters titled For Boys and For Girls, which can tell us exactly what little boys and girls were expected to be interested in. The list of boys' cakes included various forms of transportation, jet planes, tugboats, rocket ships, racing cars and sports cars, helicopters, and of course, tip trucks. Girls, on the other hand, could choose from an exciting array of domestic appliances. 
a sewing machine, a stove, or from a wide variety of cakes with dolls stuck on them or in them, dominated by ballerinas and babies. According to Clark, upon uh, publication, the test kitchen's phones rang off the hook with people asking, how dare you segregate boys and girls? How sexist of you? And yet these divisions linger. While the 2011 edition of the book removes several copyrighted cakes, including cakes of Mickey and Minnie Mouse, the section for boys' cakes and girl cakes remains even in the 2020 40th anniversary edition. The longevity of this division is perhaps due to nostalgia, as newer birthday cake books uh, like the Kids' Birthday Cakes, which was published in 2002, uh, do not have these gender-specific cakes. The Children's Birthday Cake book is undeniably an important historical object, and looking at it can tell us all sorts of things, from the changing expectations of women's labour, the changing experience of childhood, and how Australians continue to nostalgically celebrate our long history of baking and our love of sweet treats. As people share their love of this book and the cakes they create out of it, embracing humour with the fails as well as the joy of their successes, the book has become something that its creators never expected, an icon. Lauren, that was absolutely terrific. I had no idea that the 40th anniversary edition still had the cakes for girls and the cakes for boys. It's, it's such a fascinating, fascinating thing. So I think we might come back to that in our, in our Q&A as well. Before we do, though, and before we open to, to our questions, I'm interested in briefly exploring the kinds of the similarities and differences in your approaches to working with material culture, with objects. And I think this is a really interesting case because we've got objects that you're working with that are both present and absent in the sense that they leave these material records, a, a jar with the last remains of, of Vegemite in the bottom or a, a book with pages that are sticky from spilt sugar and from eager little fingers um, pouring through them. But they also disappear after we've eaten with them. And then I guess there's that sense that they also stay with us in really vivid, comforting kinds of, of memories. So the sense that these, these memories from our childhood spark your research as adults must bring with it certain opportunities and I wondered if, if you could comment on that or if you would like to perhaps comment on another aspect of each other's paper. Um, Hannah did you want to go first? Absolutely um, so I think for me Vegemite I think one of the things that I really enjoy about the the material history of Vegemite is jars being reused um, and that's something that's come right from early Vegemite jars and like there's lots of um, stories in like the Women's Weekly and stuff where they're like this is what you can do with your Vegemite jar or stories about you know making a sewing kit or something and going a Vegemite jar is the perfect jar for it and it's sort of it's like the the Vegemite itself is is gone but the jar remains and so kind of that legacy remains in a different way it's almost like when people have sort of you know there's the meme of the sewing kit in the biscuit box and going to your grandma's house and opening the biscuit box and being disappointed there's sewing needles in it and it's the same kind of thing it's just that legacy that exists outside the food um and yeah so I guess that's where I would go with that yeah that's that's so interesting what about you Lauren um so I think that one of the most joyous things about looking at the birthday cake book as material history is uh, the memories that I actually get to hear about from other people, um, their experiences and their failures. I have a um, a copy, you know, of oh, I've got several copies of the book um, <laughs> that I've picked up at op shops because, as you said, Lorinda, actually looking at those and seeing sort of where they fall open where the splatters are on the page that can really tell us a lot um and uh you know the the writing and the margins and all of that sort of thing um I've got one that, that someone has covered with like clear contact to obviously try to keep it cleaner in the kitchen and those sorts of things so looking at the book itself but I think that also the cakes are a really interesting part of material history because they are so 
alive and present and then of course we eat them and then no more um and we only really have memories and photographs and i think that those photographs of people's successes and failures and memories of having cakes are, are really important um sort of cultural artifacts as well yeah that's it's it's really really fascinating now i would like to encourage our audience to um to pop any of your burning questions into our q a function and i can see our first one's come through from sarah hayes thank you sarah so sarah wonders if both lauren and hannah you could reflect on any changes to how goods were marketed to women over time and she writes this strikes me as a continuation of the emergence of women as primary consumers in the 19th century. So to what extent does this endure today? And how about we start with you with this question? That's a good question. I think, mm. I mean, definitely the, the big colour advertisements for Vegemite appeared in the Women's Weekly. And so you do have that. That's the real iconic images that are coming through. Um, so, you know, the 50s, 60s, you've got that kind of story. And a lot of the images, the advertising images have, you know, the perfect nuclear family and mum's making a Vegemite sandwich in the kitchen, dad's out mowing the lawn and that kind of stuff. But I think it sort of changed a bit because of the nostalgia value of Vegemite and the fact that anyone can eat it. Like it's not a particularly gendered food. I think unlike baking, which is still kind of got particular gender connotations Vegemite doesn't and so now it's very much marketed on that nostalgia value regardless of gender so even from the 80s when it, they picked up the jingle um and you've got you know modern ads that are just focusing on parents and things like that so there's changing elements in that but I think it, it's probably quite different from cakes <laughs> yeah thanks thanks Hannah Lauren what about you yeah, so the birthday cake book obviously being created by Women's Weekly was made specifically for women. But I think that the interesting sort of part of it is the incorporation of the cake mix, which was sort of created as a commercial product to assist women in the kitchen um, in performing their gender duty to make cake for their family, right? Um, because not everyone can do it. Baking a cake is pretty hard sometimes. So um, I think that the weekly sort of getting on board with cake mixes and actually specifically pointing out, you can use cake mix, like don't feel bad about it. You're still a good parent. You're still a good mother. Um, I think that is really interesting and important. And they didn't like specify brands of cake mix or anything like that. It wasn't like a direct, I guess, uh, sort of marketing endeavor. Um, but just the idea that these products were there is, I think, really interesting. Yeah, great. And Sarah's just made a little comment there, lots of convenience food in the 1980s, yeah. So Mandy's come with a question. And Mandy, I'm so glad that you've asked this, and, and it's not off point at all. And this one's for, for Lauren. Lauren, can you tell us how did the test kitchens start up? <laughs> Yeah, um, so the test kitchen started like quite early in the magazine's run, um, about three years after it started in 1936. Uh, they didn't really make a great deal out of it until the Second World War, um, when they really started to look at things like nutrition and um, and showing women that it was quite that, that these recipes would definitely work because they'd been triple tested and they you know had all of these nutrition values and all of that sort of stuff. Um, it became like central to the weekly's, you know, sort of food philosophy, I suppose, is this idea of triple testing in, in the test kitchen. Um, and that's sort of where it sprang from. It was a woman called Ruth First who started it up in 1936. There we go. Fantastic. Now we've had Jane comment, and, and this is actually a really, um, a really interesting comment, and one that I might turn a, a question um, from Jane. She's written women were and are seen as in charge of the health of the family and that Vegemite uses this, this angle. And I think, Hannah, you've, you really spoke to this in, in your presentation, this idea of, of, of um, particularly children's health in, in Vegemite and that, that um, you mentioned young Albert and he's mixing Vegemite and milk, which I'm so intrigued to, to know whether you've actually tried your, your, yourself. But could you extend this a little bit more 
is this really solid link between Vegemite and healthy families. Yeah, absolutely. So what the interesting part of kind of the, the vitamin content, you know, like everyone knows Vegemite, great source of B vitamins. Like that's the thing that's on the label is it comes originally from the 1920s and like the fad of vitamin research. Um, so that's kind of when people were starting to think of vitamins as like a thing. And what's it, what's a vitamin? What's it doing? Why is it here? Um, oh my God, vitamins are amazing. And so Callister, when he was like doing the Vegemite, when he was creating it in the first place, he sort of thought, well, maybe I can find something. And so that's when he found the B vitamins because he was looking for that craze. And it really has jumped on that wagon ever since. And like, that's been its biggest selling point is the health. Um, and you do think, you know, the post-war particularly, it was that like rebuild the nation. And so it was so linked between ch children's health and like national identity because you've got to rebuild the nation. You've got to have healthy kids. You've got them, you know, they've got to grow up strong. And so that's when you start really getting that emphasis, particularly on the kids and Vegemite really being great for them. Um, and there's so many ads that go through continually. Like if you eat your Vegemite, you're going to be a real strong, healthy kid. You're going to grow up. You're going to be smart. You're going to be everything. There was profiles on babies that were really smart because they had Vegemite and things like that. I, I, I don't think Vegemite and milk is necessarily what you probably should be giving babies. Um, and I'm certainly not going to try it myself. I <laughs> respect my taste buds a little bit too much for that. <laughs> that sounds completely fair enough to me. Um, you both have touched on cookbooks. Well, sorry, Lauren, yours is completely about cookbooks. Hannah, you've touched on cookbooks. And we've had another question come through about how important were cookbooks in shifting Australian tastes, either towards salty or sweet foods over the decades? I think I will leave that question to Lauren because that is right <laughs> up her alley <laughs> of expertise about shifting Australian tastes. So... <laughs> Yes, um, the overwhelming number of recipes in cookbooks tends to be for sweet foods. Um, just in statistical breakdowns that I've done from like my work with the weekly and the other food historians have done as, as well, looking at, at different uh, recipe books. Uh, lots of that stems from the fact that it's harder to bake than it is to throw things in a pan and, and, and let it go. Uh, you know, baking is a bit of a science. Um, what we do sort of see, and I'm going to talk about the Women's Weekly cookbooks here because that is obviously what I study, um, is from about the nineteen mid-1970s when we started to get the sort of A4 soft cover Women's Weekly cookbooks that were super cheap to Buy. you know they were about three dollars in the 80s um the uh they were available you know at news agents you didn't have to go to a bookstore to buy it you didn't have to order it you know through the post or anything like that eventually they were sold in supermarkets right by the you know uh checkout where you were you know browsing your magazines and then there was a stack of cookbooks there as well those sorts of books really uh, allowed people to experiment a lot. You weren't buying a really big, expensive cookbook that was full of recipes that you may or may not use. You could pick and choose the things that appealed to you. So um, that's why we see these sorts of like anthologies where you might have, you know, you, you've got your Thai recipes, you've got your, you know, Chinese cookbook, you've got this, and people could buy what sort of suited them. So I think that in that way, um, these cookbooks really did help to introduce uh, Australians to different cuisines um, because they were so readily available. You didn't have to be, you know, a foodie or a proto foodie, I suppose, um, to, you know, say, oh, I'm really interested in that. I'm going to go and do it. You could just be in the line at the supermarket and go, oh, that looks a bit interesting. Here I go. Um, and they were really accessible and really easy to make. Step by step instructions, lots of pictures. People loved them. Yeah, it's. It it strikes me as being such a um, such an obvious thing once we start to to think about those those kinds of the popularities that spread through them. Now, I'm I'm so sorry, Mandy. I've missed a comment from you that was related to a little little bit that we were discussing earlier. So, Mandy's noted that even in the 1990s, a marketing friend of hers noted that cake mix. So, coming back to the cake mix, needed nothing but water added, 
but focus groups showed that women wanted more ownership. So you added an egg too. I think that's a really interesting thing, this idea that creating an extra step gave women that, that particular ownership. Lauren, did you want to comment a little further on that? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that is uh, definitely true. I think that even the earliest cake mixes that were coming out of the US, Australia was a relatively late adopter of cake mixes um, compared to other countries. Um, but those early cake mixes, people did say, you know, I don't just want to add water or I don't just want to add milk. I actually want to feel like I'm doing something. It can't be too easy. Um, and so that idea sort of comes through and we sort of still see that today. I don't know, you know, on social media, you'll see people sort of like pimping up their cake mixes, um, doing weird and wonderful things with them, like making it into a base for a slice and things like that. So people are using them and, and being quite creative with them, um, even still today. They're just another tool, I suppose, in, in, in the cook's arsenal. Yeah, yeah. Now... I'd like to shift direction in our questions just slightly. So we're talking about material culture as part of this seminar series. And I noticed, Hannah, you in particular in your slides had examples of Vegemite jars, tins of Vegemite um, from rations that are in museum collections. And I'd love to ask both of you whether you've, whether you've been able to find examples um, of Vegemite and all um, women's weekly birthday cake books in museum collections and whether you think that really suggests the importance of these two Australians. Hannah, would you like to go first with that one? Yeah, so I there is a lot of Vegemite like material history around um, and it's in areas that you wouldn't really expect it. So there's like obviously the ones, you know, there's the Russian tins or the tubes or whatever. But one of the interesting things I found was after the Bali bombings, um, people left, you know, sort of tributes and things like on the steps of parliament and stuff and Vegemite jars were included. And those Vegemite jars have been saved um, as part of like the National Museum's collection. Mm -hmm. And so there's sort of, it appears in very different places that you really wouldn't have expected um, there's a museum that I think is now permanent and it's from the Cyril P. Callister, so the guy who, you know, the food scientist who created it. There's a museum dedicated to him and they have a lot of objects. I mean, Vegemite's, the jar is so iconic, it's changed so much. You kind of have that visual element. Even when I Snack 2.0, the wildly criticised named cheese Vegemite, crossover my dad has a jar of that and he keeps telling me ever since I started this research he keeps telling me he's like I have the jar we've saved it in case we need it you know to preserve in the future and we have the jar and it's sort of like that people have this stuff and they've kept it and I don't think they ever intend to eat it but it's there and they're not throwing it out because they want to kind of have that kind of part of Vegemite's history I guess and I think one of the things I really love in that crossover with material history is the smell of the factory mm. being heritage like listed um, in that it's such an immaterial thing, but at the same time, it's so, you know, part of our senses and it's kind of how do you preserve a scent and how do you say a scent is important, but it is. And every time I talk to someone who has driven past, they're like, oh, yeah, you can smell Vegemite from miles away as you drive past it. So it's that kind of interesting crossover there too. Yeah, I, I love that idea of the, the scent as well and how do we how do we acknowledge how important, how significant smell is? You know, it is so kind of ephemeral that it kind of comes and goes, I guess, depending on where the, where the batches are being made, what the winds are like on a particular day. But it is so central to that experience. Um, Lauren, have you noticed many examples of Australian Women's Weekly material in museum collections? Um, there is a lot of Australian Women's Weekly material. In terms of birthday cakes, they're very hard to keep. Um, not only because they're so delicious, but also mould. Um, <laughs> so um, birthday cakes themselves, but uh, are not necessarily. But um, there's actually a, a an exhibit coming up at the Bendigo Art Gallery where they're looking at um, food in the Australian Women's Weekly and, and the birthday cake book in particular. So it is definitely there when people are looking at exhibitions of the weekly and obviously it's the 90th anniversary of the weekly this year um, so there is a lot of focus on it. I think some of the more interesting things in terms of material culture that I've seen with the birthday cake book are actually um, 
uh, it was a few years ago and by a few it could have been a decade ago I don't know things it's time is strange um uh there was a, a a cake auction where people made these birthday cakes brought them in um auctioned them off and the money went to charity so we see those sorts of things um happening quite a lot there's lots of competitions for people making these cakes and all of that sort of stuff and of course on social media uh people posting images of their cakes the, the pictures of the old books and those sorts of things um which is you know a really important record of of how this book is sort of entwined into our current cultural sort of milieu yeah yeah so let me just take that one step further for, for both of you you've both brought us up to the present day and the really important place that Vegemite and the birthday cake book still occupies in our national consciousness in 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 how we are Australian you know these ideas that these are both so critical to um to, to, to living here I love that Louis has had the episode with the the um, duck cake which was a family favorite in the Kramer household. Um, and Hannah, as you said, you know, Vegemite was, was presented to people entering Australia when they when they returned. How important are steps like that, do you think, to ensure the longevity of the birthday cake book and Vegemite? Or do you think they just continue to remain popular if we weren't reminded of them through these ways? I think it is like a process of kind of putting it in front of people's faces again and almost not not like like sort of a, almost a conscious effort of placing it as part of Australian identity so it's sort of it's sort of happened organically but at the same time there's kind of people continually reinforce it through how Vegemite's used and how people talk about it um and Vegemite like the the brand has been very very on top of promotion about these things if you look at the Vegemite website today the amount of merchandise you can buy is ridiculous there's socks there's hats there's t-shirts there's onesies there's bathers there's everything you could possibly imagine in Vegemite colors and so they're certainly doing their best to make sure that we kind of keep this you know we have this memory of Vegemite as Australian yeah, and in terms of the birthday cake book, I mean, as someone who was born in the 1980s, like I have that nostalgia of it. And I think that if the book wasn't brought up again and again, we would still have that nostalgia. Would it be as strong? Probably not. Um, we also have to remember that this book is still making money for the Women's Weekly, right? Um, their cookbook section is one of the most profitable things going at um what are they called now our media um now so uh to be reprinting and to get this book out there again to new generations is obviously important in terms of commercial success um but the incorporation of it as a part of our culture into bluey and and those sorts of things i think is really important and I think uh will sort of continue to happen and uh it sort of I guess prolongs uh or further integrates I guess the book into our culture I feel like we could keep talking for hours to come but I'm very conscious that we're ending um our our hour and I'd like to have everyone um to their next meeting or whatever they need to do by two o'clock so I am going to wrap up now I would like to really very, very warmly thank Hannah and Lauren for such terrific papers. I enjoyed them so much. Um, I feel like I immediately have to go and have some Vegemite on toast, followed by some, some cake. I'm really feeling that, that urge. I so would. I yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'd also like to thank the team behind the Material History Seminar Series, the Old Treasury Building and the Australian Catholic University. Our next seminar in the Material Histories seminar series is Early Toilets, which promises to be as exciting as it sounds. On Friday, the 25th of August this year, we'd love it if you could join us. So let me thank you all again for your attendance, your interest, your participations. We've really greatly enjoyed having you with us. Please have a look at the Material Histories page on the Old Treasury Building website for future seminars.
or if you have an idea for a seminar yourself. So thank you again, everyone, and enjoy your afternoon, whether it holds Vegemite on toast or cake. Thank you.